This morning I'm going to invite you to go with me to the cold climes of the Scandinavian country of Sweden. In the early decades of the 17th century, 1600s, the cause of Protestantism on the European continent hung in the balance. These were bleak times. The Roman Catholics, through the political arm of the Holy Roman Empire, had threatened uh, to loosen the grip of Protestantism and to sweep it off the continent altogether. It was against that that background that God thrust onto the center stage of history a a heroic figure far uh, from the far north, Gustavus Adolphus, the Swedish Reformation king, became the instrument in God's hand to stay the tide of Rome and to secure a place for the gospel in Europe. Gustavus Adolphus came to be known to the world as the Lion from the North. This is is a nickname that you'll see attributed to him in the annals of history, the Lion from the North. And I think he's one of the most inspiring figures in all of Reformation history because under the blessing of God, he saved Protestantism from annihilation. We begin with a few comments about his background in early life. He was born in Stockholm at the Stockholm Castle on December 9th in 1594. He was the oldest son of King Charles IX of Sweden and of Queen Christiana. Uh, he was born in a turbulent time. His grandfather, Vis Vasa, had escaped uh, from a Danish, a Danish uh, prison in Jutland and succeeded in delivering his country from the, ro- the, the yoke of uh, Danish tyranny. He drove the Danes from Sweden, restored their freedom, and was chosen by a grateful country to be their king. Interestingly, uh, Gustavus Vasa uh, was discipled. He was discipled by one of Luther's students. And so he was determined to make Sweden a Protestant nation. And he instituted reform, biblical reform, throughout uh, his province and states. He required all his subjects to accept this profession of faith, quote, to serve God by being obedient to his law, by loving him above all else, to believe in Jesus Christ as our only Savior, to study and teach the word of God with zeal, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to observe the Ten Commandments, such is the true worship that we should render unto God. So the subjects of Sweden were called upon by their king to make this profession. However, despite uh, Gustavus Vasas' sincere faith, the Reformation lacked widespread support in Sweden until after his death. His son, as I've already said, Charles uh, IX, this It was under his son that the Swedish church adopted the Lutheran Augsburg Confession of 1530 as the statement of its own reformed religion. Gustavus Adolphus was born in that castle. He was schooled in the classics by age 16. Uh, We're told that he was not only fluent in his native uh, Swedish and German, but he also mastered Latin, Italian, Dutch, Spanish, Russian, and Polish. His parents ensured that he was carefully nurtured to be a champion of the cause of the Protestant faith. So he was trained both as a prince and as a soldier. Already at nine years old, he was introduced to public life, accompanied his father on official state business, uh, receiving uh, petitions, conversing with foreign ministers, and even joined his father in military campaigns, all at the age of nine. Some of you children should take note. Gustavus Adolphus was only 16 years old when his father died, and he then um, succeeded to the throne. Interestingly, he inherited a country that was facing critical external threats, along with internal disintegration. In the West, there was war with Denmark that was still waging. In the East, a war with Russia. The country was bankrupt, or nearly bankrupt at the time, and riots threatened the internal stability of his kingdom. And so his father, writing to his son in his last letter at age 16, uh, gave him this counsel. He said to young Gustavus, 
quote, fear God, honor thy father and thy mother, love deeply and sincerely your brothers and sisters, esteem the faithful servants of your father, and reward each one according to his merits. Be humane toward your subjects, punish the wicked, love the good, trust everyone, but not without caution. Observe the law without respect of person, deprive no one of privileges if they are well-founded and not contrary to the general good. So Gustavus was thrust onto the scene in the midst of much uh, warfare. His personal appearance uh, gave further luster to his political savvy. He was, by all accounts, a huge man. He was tall, had broad shoulders, uh, was a muscular man with blonde hair and a handsome beard and a piercing eye. The Italians, who were not a fan, uh, called him the Golden King. Other written descriptions include, quote, that he was of lofty stature, tidy, well-proportioned, noble in all his manners and actions. He loved music and played instruments very well. However, as I said, Gustavus inherited an extremely difficult political situation. Sweden was involved in two separate military conflicts in the Baltic when his father died. A war with the Danish was eventually brought to, to an end in 1613, and then war with the Russians was concluded in 1617. In all of this, Gustavus insisted on a strict code of conduct and regular worship services in his military camps. Morning and evening, his entire army knelt before Almighty God and reverently employed his aid and favor. Gustavus was a man always, as you'll see to the end, on the front. He did not uh, wield his power from an ivory tower or a castle far away. He was in and among his men and often on the front line. He was seen digging in the trenches, helping to build fortifications, and as I said, frequently on the front line. He was severely wounded on a number of occasions, but by the 27th of February, 1617, he concluded his war with the peace of Stolboba. Eventually, uh, Gustavus uh, went on to turn his sights toward uh, Europe. His first concern was to ensure that all the authorities of all conquered cities returned to the Protestants uh, and gave them their place of worship and their freedom of religion. His contemporaries and historians have, com have commented on his extraordinary generosity and magnanimity. Uh, he th he uh, treated his conquered enemies with mildness and astonished both friends and foes. He would not tolerate any profanity nor any disrespectful jesting concerning the Bible or true religion. He often commented that he should work and live as under the eye of God. He said, quote, God has given me the crown, not that I should fear or remain in repose, but that I may consecrate my life to his glory and to the good of my subjects. And so historians note that he was often uh, found studying the word of God and quotations, copious quotations from the scriptures saturated both his conversation, his instructions, and his recorded speeches. In 1620, he visited Germany in order to marry uh, Maria, his, his wife, who was of Brandenburg. Uh, his marriage was celebrated on the 28th of November, 1620, at, at his palace in Stockholm. However, their happy marriage was grief-stricken by the first two children being stillborn. Gustavus wrote, Sorrow has come to my house. God has punished me in giving me a dead child. He accepted the loss in this instance as a chastisement from the Lord and humbled himself under Almighty God. Eventually, when Maria and uh, Gustavus were blessed with a healthy daughter, they named her Christiana after his mother, whom Adolphus rejoiced in greatly. A series of wars with Poland, though, which had begun in 1621, dragged on for most of a decade. The final conclusion of the Polish Wars was in 1629, and it was then that uh, the king turned his attention to the concerns of Protestants in Europe. And this brings us, I hope children will know this from their study of history, to the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War, very significant within the history of Europe and Christianity and the world at large. 
Uh, it was waged from 1618. That was the same date that the Synod of Dort met, uh, a significant time for the Reformed religion from 1618 to 1648. This 30 years war, a succession of armed conflicts, was essentially a religious war. So we're in the 17th century, and it is a war over religion. It began May 1618 when the Calvinists in Bohemia revolted against their king, the Jesuit trained Ferdinand II, by tossing two of his officials out of a palace window in Prague. The two men apparently survived a 70-foot fall because some claimed they landed in a pile of manure, no doubt to the amusement of the Calvinists. Ferdinand, Ferdinand uh, who, was also the holy, who was also the Holy Roman Emperor and ruler of Austria, was determined to subdue Bohemia since it supplied a significant amount of his wealth. Moreover, the monarch had dedicated himself to the restoration of Roman Catholic power over Central Europe. And so Ferdinand thus sought to, to roll back the religious gains of the Reformation in his lands with the power of the sword. He was counting on the support of such Catholic allies as Spain to achieve his goals. And so this revolt in Bohemia among the Reformed plunged Europe into a series of war, wars that lasted 30 years. Germany ends up being the staging ground for all of this, and there are three parties, and those of you who know your history will be acquainted with this. You had the Reformed, the Calvinists, the Lutherans, and the Roman Catholics. And so in Germany, each of these had their respective strongholds. The Reformed were very strong. Some of our best theologians came from Germany, though we think of Germany as a Lutheran uh, country. And in fact, there was a point at which it may have become a Reformed rather than Lutheran country, but as a result of the Thirty Years' War, it fell into the hands of the Lutherans and was established as a Lutheran uh, nation. Uh, during this time, what would later become known as the Thirty Years' War, was threatening to engulf the whole continent of Europe. Ger Germany was the battleground between the mainly Protestant North and the Catholic South. Spearheaded by the Jesuits, the Catholic Counter-Reformation was beginning to mobilize a militant counterattack against the Protestant princes of Germany. The Papists were led by uh, Archduke Ferdinand a Habsburg, who did become, as I said, Holy Roman Emperor in 1619, and his rival, Duke Maximilian of Bavaria. Now, the Lutherans were led by uh, Elector John George of Saxony, and so the Calvinists were led by Prince Frederick. The Protestants formed a defensive union. As the Calvinists and the, and the Lutherans and the Catholics forged what became known as a Catholic League in opposition. When Spain was seeking to reconquer Holland, which was a, a reformed nation, the Dutch sought to support fellow Protestants in Bohemia, uh, who the Dutch sought the support of fellow Protestants in Bohemia who were resisting the imposition of Catho the Catholicism of Ferdinand. So the Bohemians elected Prince Frederick as their king. Ferdinand responded by saying, quote, it were preferred to rule over a desert than over a country of heretics. This is a papist referring to Protestants. And with this, he unleashed a wave of religious persecution and political oppression, which raised the indignation and opposition of the Protestant majority in Bohemia. And so they called upon their brethren in Hungary, Moravia, Cilicia, and the Evangelical Union in Germany to aid them in their fight. The high point of this struggle for the Roman Catholics was the forcible expulsion by the Austrian armies of 30,000 Protestant families from Bohemia, a long bastion of Hussite, of the Hussite church, and of Protestantism. In the words of one historian, this was, quote, the most signal and permanent triumph of the Counter-Reformation. And so an edict passed that same year, declaring this to be a Roman Catholic victory, and in 1629, they stripped all of the Calvinists in the various German states of their civil rights. General Tilly swept over Germany, pillaging and devastating towns, churches, and villages. Uh, the Protestants were aware that this was a prelude to their extermination. Spain and Austria's early military success and their plans to occupy the naval bases on the North Sea 
and Baltic coast led the Dutch to encourage King Christian of Denmark to open a second front against the Habsburgs. Uh, this all ended up not materializing. And so it was against this backdrop that the German Protestants appealed to King Gustavus Adolphus for their protection. And I need to make, I need to make very clear to you from the onset, it's important for us to note that religious convictions were the central motive in Gustavus' decision to lead an army into the heart of Europe. He rightly believed that he could not sit idly by and watch fellow believers suffer to such a degree and in such large measures. In fact, many of the persecuted were per persecuted Protestants fled to Sweden for safety. And so Gustavus assembled his senate and described the injuries suffered by the brethren in Germany, the imminent danger that would come to Sweden itself, and he determined to rescue the German Protestants from this war of annihilation being waged against them. He was aware that he was about to enter a struggle against a sovereign who was feared by all of Europe and who thought he was invincible. So he put his affairs in order called his, his senate together, and holding his four-year-old Christiana in his arms, he addressed the leaders at the hall of the assembly with these words. He said, quote, if, he says, quote, I've not thoughtlessly engaged in this perilous war which calls me far from you. Heaven is my witness that it is neither for my satisfaction nor personal interest that I go into this conflict, ready to sink under the weight of oppression which hangs over them. The German Protestants stretch suppliant hands to us. If it please God, we will give them aid and protection. I'm not ignorant of the dangers that await me. I've already been in many others, and by the grace of God, I have ever come happily out of them, but I feel that I may lose my life there, and this is why, before leaving you, I recommend you all to the, to the protection of the Omnipotent One. He went on to exhort the pastors to preach the pure gospel to their flocks and to be examples of true Christian conduct. He spoke to his citizens, wishing them prosperity. But then he said, Likewise, finally I send up to God most ardent prayers for all my subjects, for a well from the depths of my heart, and perhaps for forever. Gustavus assembled 15,000 soldiers, and with 30 vessels of war, 200 transport ships, they set sail for Europe. When they landed on the shores of Germany, he called upon them to get on their knees. 15,000 knelt, and he prayed as their king, O thou that rulest over the heavens and the earth, over winds and over seas, how can I worthily thank thee for the marvelous protection which thou hast shown during this perilous voyage? My heart is full of gratitude for thy favors. O design to favor my undertaking here, so that it may not turn out, so that it may turn out not uh, to my, but to thy glory. Grant through me to deliver the oppressed church and to be thy faithful servants, a source of great consolation. He exhorted his so soldiers, and he said, Pray without ceasing. The more prayers, the more victories. Think not that I undertake this war for myself or for my kingdom. We go to succor our oppressed brethren. By brilliant victories, you can accomplish this generous project. Fear not the enemy that we're going to meet in battle. They are the same that you have already conquered in Russia. Your bravery has just compelled Poland to conclude a truce of six years. If you still show the same courage and perseverance, you will, sec you will secure to the evangelical church and to our brethren in Germany the peace and security for which they are now suffering. And then he followed with a speech about rules and regulations. The soldiers were warned that any murder or looting or attempt against life or property would be punished by death. Their conduct was to be blameless, as they were Christian soldiers fighting in a sacred cause. The success that attended his campaign in the Thirty Years' War is often ascribed to his genius as a tactician, and there is some merit in that. He only had a population of 85,000 people, and frankly, it was impossible for Gustavus to field a completely Spanish army capable of waging war on the European continent. And so he decided to, to augment his army 
with skillful, well-trained soldiers from other nations, of which those from Scotland were the most notable. And here I'm going to make a brief segue because I'm about to give you a piece of history that you will not find in any of the literature on the life of Gustavus Adolphus, namely his connection to Scotland. If I were to ask, if I were to ask you to identify the source for the introduction of the gospel to the highlands of Scotland, what would you say? Many of you will know that it was not until the 19th century. It was late, very late in history, not until the 19th century, the 1800s, that the gospel really began to flourish in the north of Scotland. The beginning of the 19, at the beginning of the 1800s, very little Scottish witness. By the end, it was the bastion of Reformed Orthodoxy in all of the world. But that's not where it began in the 19th century. Others of you who are a little more astute historically will remember the names uh, like Thomas Hogg, who was a covenanting minister in the late 1600s, who was minister of the parish of Kiltern. So there's a, a Highland witness in the late 1600s. And you might draw the conclusion that the gospel then came up through the lowlands in the covenanting movement and had at least made a little, though brief and small, showing within the highlands. The true answer is little known by most people. The true answer is that the early source, the, the, the initial source of the gospel in the highlands was Scandinavia, was Sweden. Gustavus not only rec recruited Puritans from Britain to serve as chaplains in his army, which he did. Names like William Ames and others will be familiar to you. He also gathered mercenaries, hired soldiers from the highlands to augment his troops. These were men who knew nothing of the gospel. And these pagans first heard the gospel under the leadership of Gustavus and through the ministries of their Puritan chaplains. On their return after the war, these now Christian men brought home the gospel to the highlands with them. No churches existed, but they formed private gatherings in their homes for prayer and reading of the word. The influence of the return of these men and of the stamp that Gustavus Adolphus had left was so prevalent that over 250 years later, godly parents continued to give the name Gustavus, the first name Gustavus, to their children born in the highlands. So if you go to the end of the 1800s, one of the top two or three most preeminent free church, Scottish Presbyterian Highland ministers, one of the most influential Highland ministers in the late 19th century was Gustavus Aird. He served as moderator of our church, the General Assembly, in 1888. And he noted that several who served on his session throughout his lengthy ministry bore the first name Gustavus. Still found, albeit less common today in Scotland. So back to the war, the Thirty Years' War. The loyalty that he inspired among his soldiers was a key factor in his success. One of these Scottish officers I just referred to, referred to who served under him wrote, quote, such a general would I gladly serve, but such a general I shall hardly see, whose custom was to be the first and last in danger himself, gaining his officers' love and being the companion both of their labors and, and dangers. When he landed in Germany in 1630 with his small but well-trained army, it seemed as if Protestant cause in Europe was lost. All the Protestant princes of Germany had been defeated at that point by the Count of Tilly. And uh, General Wallenstein and the commanders of the Imperial Catholic armies were preparing to crush every vestige of Protestantism in Germany. As he landed, the imperial papists, the Catholic forces, sneered at who they called not the lion from the north, but the snow king. They called him the snow king and predicted that he would melt as he moved southward. 
But he proved not to be the Snow King, the Lion from the North. Multiple plots to assassinate him were uncovered, and his officers urged him to take precautions, which he repeatedly refused, always taking the front line. He retorted, quote, I trust in God, I fear nothing. What shall man do unto me? While, co while conquering one section, he was scouting with 70 of his cavalry, and they were suddenly surprised, surrounded by 500 of the enemy. King's horse was shot out from under him. Many of his men fell all around him during the furious, furious fighting, and it looked as if they would be completely overwhelmed. When the Lord provided a band of, of Finns, Finnish, who came and helped disperse the, the enemy several times during his military career, Gustavus was saved from what seemed like death by some miracle. On one occasion, men all around him fell under a, shad, a shower of cannonballs and musket shots so that his clothes were literally splattered, covered in blood. He himself was shot in the neck, on the shoulder, and in the stomach, and kept fighting. He suffered a saber wound on his hand and numerous other injuries. Because of the shot to the neck, he was unwilling to wear the, the common uh, metal uh, garb that would cover him. Instead, he wore flexible leather in order to uh, protect his wounded neck. Uh, tragically, after a, a heroic uh, resistance, Magdeburg fell to Tilly's imperial troops, uh, betrayed by traitors and undermined by the procrastination of its neighbors. The richest city in Germany at that time was overcome by fury and savagery as drunken soldiers of nine nations purged the Protestants. The victims were so numerous, estimated to be about 25,000 people, that they were thrown in wagon loads into the river Elbe. In one church, 53 young little girls were beheaded. Croatians laughed as they cast little children in the midst of flames. The tortures and horrors perpetrated in Magdeburg were so shocking that several imperial officers sought Tilly to put them to an end. To which this papist general replied, I have promised three days for pillaging and slaying. The soldiers must have some amusement after so many fatigues. Within 12 hours, Magdeburg was a roaring furnace and it was reduced. This vast opulent city was reduced to smoldering ruins and ashes. This, of course, was reported throughout Europe as a great triumph for the Catholics, and it was a frightful tragedy to what many Protestants thought uh, was going to happen over all of Europe. September 17th, at the Battle of Breitenfeld near Leipzig, the, the Saxons and Swedes combined to confront Tilly's Catholic League. In many ways, this battle was to determine the entire future of Protestantism and, and Catholicism in Europe. I need a few young men back there to give me your attention if you'll try to, to, to focus. Gustavus addressed his troops and reminded them that the very existence of Reformation in Germany depended upon the outcome of this battle. He said, quote, We battle not for the honors of this world, but for the word and the glory of God, for the true faith which alone can save us, the faith which the Catholics have cruelly oppressed and which they would gladly blot out of existence. The results of the victory at Leipzig were immense. The united forces of the Catholics had been annihilated. Barely 2,000 remained of their previously invincible army. Tilly had lost all of his artillery, nearly 18,000 men, and he could only retreat toward Bavaria in southern Germany. With no imperial army left to stop him, Gustavus liberated the lower parts of those uh, nations uh, and then took uh, several other major cities and entered on December 10th, uh, Mans. When a Jesuit priest was captured attempting to assassinate the king, Gustavus responded, quote, The king cannot live shut up in a box. The wicked have not so much power as ill will, and confidence in God is the best safeguard. God knows perfectly well how long he wishes to employ my frail arm. If I fail, he will raise up another instrument more worthy and more powerful than I. His work does not depend on the life of one man. 
Even the Bavarian priests praised the nobility, uh, praised him for his, how generous he was toward his, his adversary. In fact, Gustavus would go and visit the priests and would engage them in discussions about the gospel, speaking to them in fluent Latin. At the beginning of 1632, Gustavus pursued Tilly into Bavaria, where he defeated the imperial forces at the bat Battle of Lack. He then liberated the long-oppressed uh, Protestant cities of Augsburg, the city in which I was born, and Ulm. In May, he occupied Munich, the capital of Bavaria. And the magistrates and citizens of Nuremberg received him with much rejoicing. You have, uh, there's some printed copies, and I know some of this can, can be a little difficult for someone to read to you, but let me just read the address that he gave, or part of the address he gave to the city of Nuremberg. He says, I thank you. I can wish nothing better in return than perseverance in the evangelical faith. Let nothing turn you from it, neither threats nor promises, nor any of the passions to which the human nature is subject. Let not the riches of the world make you forgetful of the still more precious treasures of heaven. You have wicked and wily enemies whose aim is the annihilation of Protestantism. Their hope is found... Is, is to found a peace upon the ruin of all Protestants, and they seek their end by the destruction of millions of souls. God has entrusted to you the administration of an opulent and powerful city, so govern it not as to fear to give an account which you one day have to render at the tribunal of God. In these misfortunes, God has aimed to make you feel how much we are sinners, for you are the defense of the gospel. I left my peaceful home and came into your agitated country. I sacrifice the resources of my poor subjects, their blood, my life, and love of my family. I will do for you all that the grace of God will give me power to do. On your side, be willing to suffer a while, if need be, for a sacred cause. Remain faithful to it, then God will bless you. He will cause your city to flourish. His name will be everywhere revered. And after the glory and honor of the earth will come that of heaven." After seeing Tilly, the butcher of Magdenburg, suitably pu punished, Gustavus rode into Augsburg as the citizens sang from Psalm 103 and rejoiced over their liberation. He entered this, this city where the princes were first called Protestants for resisting Emperor Charles V a long time before and where where uh, Melanchthon had presented the Augsburg Confession a hundred years before with emotion and great rejoicing. Subsequent battle, and I'll have to skip some material here, Cannonball had swept the king's horse from under him. The man next to him, uh, a duke, had his head shot off. A few minutes later, the, co the king was covered with blood and dust. All around feared that Gustavus had been killed, but instead he found his way to his feet, rose and declared, quote, The apple is not yet ripe. Neither my high birth, nor my royal crown, nor my weapons, nor my many victories can save me from death. I submit to the will of God. If he takes me from the world, he will not abandon the sacred cause which I defend. I know that I can count upon the aid of the all-powerful and that it is he who has sent me to Germany. And that brings us to the final stage, the battle of of Lutzen. This is the closing drama, if you will. Wallenstein rallied the, the Catholic forces for a last round, a, la, a last stand, rather, at Lutzen, a town southeast of present-day Leipzig in Germany. This all-important battle proved decisive in the conflict between Protestants and Catholics. So now we're at the morning of November 6th. Uh, 1632. The two armies faced each other in battle array. Gustavus summoned his chapel and spent one hour with him in prayer, and then went and attended the regular religious services held every morning and evening with his soldiers. He remained upon his knees during the whole service. He requested that his, chaplain, uh, that his chaplain lead the, the troops in worship. He rose to his feet after that, prepared to engage uh, his Catholic adversaries. A thick fog had covered the plain in which the battle was to take place. And as the Swedes sang psalms, Wallenstein's cannon announced their impeding assault. 
Gustavus gave the command, God is with us. As he mounted his horse with armor, his, his officers pled with him, excuse me, as he mounted his horse without armor, his officers pleaded with him to wear armor. He replied, the eternal one is my armor. He then rode along the lines to encourage his men. So he's at the front of the battle. And he announced, the day has arrived in which you are to show what you have already learned in war. Hold yourselves ready. Conduct yourselves as worthy soldiers. Fight valiantly for your God, your country, and your king. I beseech you in the name of a Christian conscience and of your honor to do your duty today as you have done heretofore. March with courage. I myself will show the way. I am ready to risk my life and to shed my blood with you. Follow me, have confidence in God, and bear away a victory whose fruits you and your posterity will gather forever. Soldiers respond to a shout of joy and enthusiasm. At 11 a.m., the fog had dissipated. The sun brilliantly illuminated the field of Lutzen. Gustavus raised his eyes toward heaven and cried, Jesus, Jesus, be thou my help this day while we battle for the glory of thy sacred name. He then brandished his sword high above his head and commanded, Forward now in the name of the Lord. The king placed himself on the right wing of his army, led them across the trenches that had been dug by the Austrians, and when his infantry did not advance fast fast enough, he dismounted and charged with them to inspire them with a better example. Continuing in the front line, Gustavus sought to strengthen each weak point, inspired his men to throw back the enemy. At a crucial point in battle, he became separated from his troops, and while leading a cavalry charge into a dense cloud of gunpowder gun, uh, gun powder smoke, uh, he was hit by gunfire, and he fell and was killed while lying severely wounded on the ground. This is the battle of Lutzen. Rather than striking terror in the hearts of his companions, that moment proved to be a turning point in the battle for the good of the Protestants. Instead of losing heart and fleeing, the Swedish troops charged the foe with a fierceness born out of sorrow and despair. And before the day was ended, another glorious victory for the Protestant cause had been won. The Protestant cause was saved, but the noble Gustavus had made the supreme sacrifice. This victory was a cause of was was a cause of grief more than joy to the Swedes. Nothing could compensate for the loss of their beloved king. However, true to his vision, he had remained faithful to his mission and had su- successfully fought for the cause of Christ. He had championed the cause of Protestantism and secured its freedom. He was a dedicated Christian, a reformer king, and a great general. His example transformed the art of warfare, changed the course of history, liberated Protestant Germany from the threat of annihilation, and the whole course of modern history would have been dramatically different had not the Lord worked in such a tremendous way through the courageous crusade of this lion from the north. Just briefly, because this is what uh, the historians make much ado of, briefly about his, his military genius. He's recognized by everyone to this day as one of the top three or five greatest generals in the history of the world. Uh, Even Napoleon considered Gustavus one of the greatest generals of all time. And his genius is seen in a lot of things. He's famous, first of all, for employing mobile artillery on the battlefield. He was also known for very aggressive tactics where attack was stressed over defense and mobility emphasized over the usual linear tactics. Uh, His musketeers were widely known for their shooting accuracy and reload speed three times faster than any contemporary rivals. He himself, as you've noted, was an active participant in his battles and chose to lead his charges himself 
at crucial moments. He also is attributed with a number of technical innovations, including paper bullet cartridges, light mobile artillery, lightening the muskets and, and abolishing the musket rest. He also innovated administrative reforms um, and a whole list of other things that I have here. He perfected dashing cavalry charges, offensive infantry formations, volley fire, and close artillery support to clear the way to front rapid infantry or cavalry uh, advances. And so he's called by historians the father of modern armies. armies. To Protestants, though, Gustavus is one of the greatest examples of Christian and Reformed king. He was a protector of Protestantism and under God a deliverer for Germany. His timely, in, his timely intervention stopped the onward march and devastation caused by the Catholic League and the Austrian Empire, the Holy Roman Empire being dealt a ferocious blow. There's no doubt that the, the whole course of European history has been altered as a consequence. Let me give you a few brief lessons in addition to what's already been noted and will be done. Number one, as the Lord's people, we need a life dominated by zeal for God's glory and the spread of God's gospel. We need a life dominated by God, zeal for God's glory and the spread of God's gospel. In many ways, Gustavus, after having defeated the Danes and the Russians, could have taken ease. He had a castle, he had a, a daughter, he had a wife, he had much to tend to. But he, he sacrificed that, personally sacrificed himself for the spread of, of the gospel. And you see in all that he's doing, his, his, his uh, life, privately and publicly, he is pursuing the glory of God, he's pursuing the advance of the gospel. And whether it was amongst his troops or whether it was in his, his political uh, decisions that were made in terms of national policy, this was his, his goal. And so it, it falls to us. We're not kings of Sweden, kings of anything, barely kings of our own uh, property at times. But it falls to us, however young, however old, male or female, it falls to us to, to be captivated by God's Spirit with a zeal for his glory and a zeal for the spread of his gospel that will not take second place to anything else in our life above our vocational pursuits, above our familial interests, above that which is temporal and financial and so on. It has to be said in the daily action of our lives. It has to be demonstrated in the testimony of our lives that we are consumed with the, the pursuit of God's glory. Secondly, notice the primacy of personal piety. What we do for God must be done with God. This was an eminently godly man. Eminently godly. He feared the Lord. He, he was devoted to his worship. He was devoted to seeking his face. He walked with the Lord all the day. He was heard quoting scripture, singing psalms, uh, crying out Christian exhortations to those who were around him. Walking with the Lord was the source of his blessing. He says himself, his ability to go into battle was a consciousness of the Lord being at his right hand. And so he cultivated personal piety. The idea of activism in the Christian world that is devoid of personal piety is an empty husk. It leads to nothing but a rancid form of moralism and eventual liberalism. We have to say the first thing must be walking with the Lord, private worship, prayer, the reading of God's word, the memorization of his psalms to be sung, laying up these truths in our heart under the all-seeing eye of God. We see the primacy of personal piety. Thirdly, we see national religion is indispensable. National religion. Sweden had a national religion, and he sought to obtain for Germany a national religion. A national religion is worth praying for, it's worth living for, and as Gustavus proves, 
it is worth dying for. The cause of Christ not only has implications for godly marriages and godly parenting and godly churches, but it has implications for godly nations. The civil structure, with all of its political apparatus, has to be shaped by the Word of God and the law of God. And nations are required to profess the true religion and to serve with whatever resources God gives them to serve in seeking its advance. Gustavus models this for us. And though many American Christians, including Reformed Christians, would abandon such models, we must take them up and reassert them. Just like the Josiahs and Hezekiahs of the past, Constantines, the Genevas, and places like Scotland, we need the true religion. Fourthly, you see that Romanism, Roman Catholicism, the papacy, remains a great enemy of the gospel. It is a great enemy of the gospel. You do not have to peruse the annals of history very deeply, modern history, without recognizing that this is the fact. History is strewn with the reality that Rome is still our greatest enemy, the greatest enemy of Christ and the greatest enemy of his gospel. And so in Greenville, South Carolina, and in other places where people, even evangelicals, are slipping, thinking to themselves, well, they're doing a lot of good things, and there's a lot of, you know, good people, and there's a lot of this, that, or the other thing. We need to banish that from our hearts and minds. We need to recognize it, that it is a satanic religion. In the words of Lloyd-Jones, it is the devil's masterpiece, Romanism. <laughs> and it continues to be the dominant threat to the gospel worldwide. Remember the blood of your father's children. Countless thousands, if not millions, have had their blood shed at the hands of the papacy. <coughs> Fifthly, remember the exhortation of Luke 12:32, "Fear not, little flock, for it is your it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom." Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. My friends, God is pleased to steer the course of history for the advance of his kingdom. What we see there in Lutzen and in Germany can be retold in other places a hundred times over, where it looks as if things are all but lost, and it is sheer impenetrable darkness. And sometimes that advance, the Lord's advance, comes from the most unlikely places under God's care. Who would have thought that Scandinavia would be the source for securing Protestantism in Central Europe? And yet the Lord was pleased to work generations prior to the rise of Gustavus to prepare a way uh, toward that end. And so we live in a day that looks dark. The tide uh, has risen and it looks as if biblical religion, the true reformed religion, is at a very low ebb. The tide of unbelief has risen high, and we are to fear not, for it is our, God, it is our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, to recognize that while we watch and wait, while we pray and preach, while we seek to, to carry out the callings God's given us, that he may yet ple be pleased under these small, unexpected measures uh, to bring about yet again strides forward in the advance of his cause. Lastly, let me say that this brings with it inescapably personal sacrifice. Gustavus was repeatedly wounded in battle, including gunshots to the neck, throat, abdomen. And yet, amidst all of this, he continued to give himself, acknowledging this day may be my last day, but it will be the best possible way in which to have spent my last day, lifting up the banner of King Jesus in his cause. It comes with personal sacrifice. You might think, well, you know, we can't load up in our cars right now and run off to some battle that's being waged to save uh, Calvinism, the biblical religion, somewhere in America. There's no such battles being fought. It's that bad. But personal sacrifice is seen in a lot of ways, things that we say no to with our time in order to say yes to 
and conscientious pursuit of Christ. Things that we say no to with our money in order that we might say yes to things that would support the advance of his cause. It might mean long hours spent in study or in caring for responsibilities and and going above and beyond and raising up these covenant children in the ways of God and parting to them, even in a measure, what we can. Gustavus was no pygmy. I mean, not only was he physically a, a significant figure, but you think of all the training, his parents tutoring him in the, in the Reformed religion, you know, calling upon him to uphold these things, praying with him, you know, giving, furnishing him with a, a phenomenal education that would end up serving in the, the cause of, of Christ as a leader of his nation and so on. All of these are ways in which we make sacrifice, and there are many, many more. You can fill in the blank for yourself. But we need to, we need to grasp the nettles. We need, to, we need to embrace sacrifice. We need to do a little bit of self-analysis and say, what's my comfort level right now? If I'm not being pinched or pained, if there's not evidence of sacrifice in my life for something in some arena where I'm seeking Christ's glory, something is wrong that needs to be repented of and amended by God's grace. And so may he give us a spirit of sacrifice and the absence of fear and a, a warm and vibrant personal piety and a life dominated for his zeal and glory that we might follow in the train of one of our Reformed fathers, Gustavus Adolphus.